The previous video that I made to do with Triple J's Hottest 100 Countdowns was pretty fun to make, so here I am back again on that subject. Just from that last video where I only looked at the songs that reached number one on each of Triple J's Hottest 100 charts, you could get the impression that the average Triple J listener either has a bit of an odd taste in music, a warped sense of humour, or a mix of both. But of course, those number one songs are just the tip of the iceberg. So join me as I bring you what I believe to be the weirdest song in every yearly edition of the Hottest 100. There's basically five categories of weirdness that I can sort each of the upcoming songs into. One of those categories is songs that are weird in basically every sense. Next you have songs that are largely in this video for their bizarrely or hilariously whacked out lyrics. Songs that are mostly straightforward, but have one or two things about them that I find really odd. Then there's other songs that might not be quite as weird as the songs that I'd put in those first three categories, but just feel completely out of place in a Hottest 100 in general. And then the final category is basically me saying, this countdown was boring. But, well, I had to pick something. I've deliberately avoided some fairly well-known wacky songs over the years, because obviously people are going to vote for songs called Detachable Penis and were known as Big Brown Beaver. Also, the core list in this video is based on annual Hottest 100s only. Though at the end of the video, I will discuss a song that appeared in one of Triple J's multi-year countdowns that I find to be quite strange. Kicking off with 1993. Number 78. East 17. Deep. Looking through this particular Hottest 100 list, it's like, yep, yeah, these songs make sense. A lot of underground artists that had a bit of mainstream success as well. A few mainstream songs that have a bit of crossover appeal for indie fans. Then all of a sudden, Boy Band. I'm not just picking this song simply because it's by a boy band, though. Because Triple J's audience clearly wasn't entirely against pop and R&B, as evidenced by Shoop, Dreams by Gabrielle, and Culture Beat's Mr. Vane also appearing in the chart. I'm choosing this song because most of it is just the one guy telling his woman how he's gonna sex her up over a corny-ass reggae pop drum loop. And his delivery is just so devoid of energy. This guy has minus a hundred riz. What your body wants, I got this. You sure about that? Apparently, reviewer Neil Spencer considers the song to be surprisingly clever songwriting with sly sexuality. This is for a song that includes lines like I wanna do it till my belly rumbles Yeah, I'll butter the toast If you lit the knife while I fiddle, you can fantasize Is he fiddling with her? Or himself? What is this? Deep by E17 is one of the least sensual sounding attempts at a sensual R&B song that I've ever heard. Plus musically, it sounds like a song that would have come out in 1990, when popular music hadn't completely shaken off all of the trends of the 80s. Not 1993! Deep by E17 sounds too weird for the pop crowd, yet not weird enough for the underground. Yet it somehow managed to appeal to both. 1994. Number 9. Tom Jones, If I Only Knew. Like A17's appearance the year before, this is Tom Jones's only appearance in an annual Hottest 100 to date. That's a bit weird in and of itself, but also, I would contend that this song is kind of batshit insane. I remember half hearing a Tom Jones song on the car radio several years ago and just thinking, what the hell is this? I know now for a fact that, that song was If I Only Knew, because the two main things I remember about it were, and a verse from what I originally thought was a guest rapper. Nope, all Jones, baby! Tom Jones rap! Tom Jones rap! I'm pretty sure when I first heard the rap in this song, I thought it might have been the guy from the Bloodhound Gang for some reason. Anyway, now that I've properly heard it, Jones' rapping sounds more like a baritone vanilla ice. If I Only Knew's production was overseen by Trevor Horn, a pioneer producer who was one of the first people to bring sampler keyboards to pop music in the 80s. Those janky brass stabs in the intro are basically signature Trevor Horn. However, this song's actually a cover of a 1992 single by American rap rock band Rise Robots Rise, and the original song did already have that brass sample riff in it. Maybe Horn was trying to reclaim his influence with this updated version for Tom Jones. Unlike E17's Deep, which just sounds completely dated, If I Only Knew sounds like it has one foot in the 90s and the other back in the 80s. 
Big honourable mention to the number 66 song that year, which was Hobo Hump and Slowbo Babe by Whale. One of the few songs with an outrageous title that I found whilst looking through these countdowns that's actually backed up by some pretty crazy music. But my main pick is the Tom Jones song because it has an uncanniness to it for me, rather than the Whale song being zany in a loud and over-the-top way. I dig that song, right? 1995, number 54, The Vaughns, Who Farted? Who Farted? <laughs> Yeah, this one should speak for itself. What I'll add though is that the Vaughns released an album in 1995, including Who Farted, and at least two other poop themed songs by the looks of it. Then they disappeared. Though 13 years later, they also put out two new songs on Triple J's Unearthed site, which is normally supposed to be for up-and-coming artists to get their music out there. Well, it didn't get the Vaughns back out there because I think they disappeared again after this. So I don't think we'll be getting that Work of Ass album anytime soon. How devastating. Honourable mention goes to number 12, the reefer song by Mindless Drug Hoover, because it sounds like something that would have gone viral in the early days of YouTube or as an early 2000s flash animation. And I have even less of a clue what the fuck happened to this guy than I do with the Vaughns. 1996, number 8, Allen Ginsberg, Ballad of the Skeletons. I pointed out in my last Hottest 100 video that there were some peculiar songs appearing in the top 20 of 1996's Hottest 100, including this one, which is still the song that baffles me the most out of all the songs in this countdown. Ginsberg was an American poet from the Beat Generation who first gained prominence in the 1950s. His Ballad of the Skeletons poem was first published in 1995, and the following year he recorded a recital of that poem over a bluesy instrumental performed by musicians like minimalist composer Philip Glass, Lenny Kay of Patty Smith group fame, and most prominently, Sir Paul McCartney. The song's music video also led to 70-year-old Ginsberg becoming one of the oldest artists to ever be played on MTV. Now like I said, Ginsberg was an American poet, and he often wrote about American things, including in this particular poem, where the first line references a president. Said the presidential skeleton, I won't sign the bill. So and later references things like the New York Times and the North American Free Trade Agreement. And yet this still somehow had mass appeal to Australians? Moreover, the poem is just about 66 lines of this person said this, and this person said that. And they also all happen to be skeletons, which I think is trying to say that, you know, on the inside, we're all just a bag of bones. So in summary, the poem is, we live in a society. Lastly, earlier in the 90s, Ginsberg became known as a member and major advocate of NAMBLA. If voting a NAMBLA member into the Hottest 100 Top 10 isn't weird, then I don't know what is. Honourable mentions involving artists who presumably don't support kid diddlers. Number 31, a cover of Mana Mana by British metal band Skin. <laughs> And number 68, which was Adam Clayton and Larry Mullen Jr.'s version of the Mission Impossible theme. Cause... was it really that good? 1997, number 5, Pauline Pants Down, Backdoor Man. Pauline Pants Down is a drag queen, parodying the Australian Senator Pauline Hanson. One could argue that Hanson is Australia's equivalent to Bernie Sanders, if Sanders spent most of his time arguing that straight white people are the most oppressed class in society. I believe we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. They have their own culture and religion form ghettos and do not assimilate. Backdoor Man uses samples from several recorded Pauline Hanson speeches and turns it into essentially a YouTube poop eight years before YouTube even existed. I'm a backdoor man. I'm homosexual. What I've called for is a homosexual government. I'm very, very proud that I'm not straight. A lot of people started requesting that Triple J play Backdoor Man, but once Hanson herself found out about the song, she just laughed it off as kids being silly and continued on with her work as a politician. Just kidding, she went to court and got ABC to stop playing the song. Freedom of speech does not extend by allowing people the right to defame others. Unless you're Pauline Hanson, then go ahead and defame people as much as you want. In response, Pants Down put out another song the following year featuring his Hanson sentence mixing, titled I Don't Like It. I don't like it. When you turn my voice about, I don't like it. 
When you vote one nation out. The song only reached number 58 in the next Hottest 100 countdown. However, nationally, it reached number 10. This is why Australia is better than the United States. It's just a fact. This is better than like 80% of all types of political comedy that have been attempted since the Colbert Report ended. Why? Why did you have to move over to the late show? You bastard! For a non-comedic example, honourable mention goes to The Mavises at number 37 with Naughty Boy. With grinding guitars and theatrical vocals ranging from a vaguely Middle Eastern sounding melody in the opening to an unholy shriek in the chorus. <laughs> It gets even better when you find out that their next single sounded like this. Cry. 1998, number 36, Tism, What Are Ya? Tism are an Australian institution, forming in the early 1980s and garnering a pretty sizeable cult following thanks to their outrageous and quintessentially Aussie shock humour. Just reading their Wikipedia page or looking at what their many song titles are is enough of a pisser in and of itself. This is enhanced by some of their musical performances on songs like What Are Ya being a little more deadpan. There's only four Hottest 100 charting Tism songs that I could have chosen for in this video, and three of them were in the 1995 edition. But unlike Who Farted by the Vaughns, <laughs> Tism's music has aged relatively well in spite of its outlandishness. On What Are Ya, which is one of their slightly more radio-friendly songs, the band posits that in this world, you're either a yob or a wanker. There is genuine cleverness to the song, though. Give me this over Ginsberg any day. Also, I'm not going to pass up on a song that features a repeated loop of I'm a wanker, I'm a wanker, I'm a wanker. I don't even directly listen to Tism all that much, but fuck yeah, long live Tism. Honourable mentions go to Adam Sandler with Somebody Kill Me from The Wedding Singer at number 39. Again, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. And another honourable mention at number 98, which was Foo Fighters covering Baker Street. Because there was a time where people would just shit bricks when Foo Fighters did literally anything. 1999, number three, The Tenants, You Shit Me To Tears. The Tenants won a Triple J Unearthed competition in 1998, off the strength of their song, You Shit Me To Tears, a ska song with a chorus that ends with, For fuck's sake. And yes, it was the third most voted for song in 1999. At that time, it was the only song that The Tenants had properly recorded and released. But they did soon follow it up with a debut album, seven years later. Since that album, I think the tenants have been largely inactive, aside from a few live performances in 2022. So their story basically begins and ends with You Shit Me To Tears. But it just goes to show how unmistakably Aussie expressions of anger can deeply resonate with Triple J listeners. Honourable mention goes to Peter Hellier at number 35 with Bevan the Musical. The gist of it is Hellier reading out an oral history of sorts about a singer named Bevan Adensall who performed on the Aussie TV show Young Talent Time, interspersed by the comedy music trio Tripod performing parodies of pop songs that generally involve changing the word heaven to Bevan. Now they're buying a stairway to <laughs> and it's about 12 minutes long? Yeah. 2000. Number 67. Machine Gun Fellatio. Motherfucker on a Motorcycle. My memory of how this song sounded after hearing it in the background several years ago differs a little bit to how the song sounds to me whilst I've heard it as I put this video together. But in each case, my overall opinion has been the same. This song is fucked. I genuinely feel like my brain is warping when I hear that slide guitar loop, and it's not helped by the vocal part sounding like a lost, obscene blues song from the 50s. Then it suddenly switches up with some heavy metal power chords and these hilariously out-of-time orchestral hits. So this is like that Tom Jones song from earlier, but on copious amounts of acid. I was originally going to have this as an honourable mention in the 1999 countdown, but it also appeared in the 2000 countdown, so that gave me an opportunity to... Hang on, how did this appear in two annual Hottest 100s? I don't know, but Motherfucker on a Motorcycle is one of seven songs that charted in one yearly countdown, and then somehow appeared in the countdown the next year as well. So I guess whoever kept fucking this up managed to keep their job at Triple J for at least eight years. 2001, number 17, Ben Folds, Rockin' the Suburbs. 
My parents have always loved this song, and I'll probably always find it at least slightly amusing too. Ben Folds is the type of musician who writes a strongly emotional song like Brick, then puts it on an album right before a song with the chorus His debut solo single after the original breakup of the Ben Folds 5 was outrageous as ever, opening with the line Let me tell y'all what it's like Being male, middle class and white Perhaps not as precedented, however, was the song's change from his usual piano rock style to a song built around guitars that sometimes shift into new metal style breakdowns, adding on to the lyrics that could poke fun at the suburban angst of bands like Limp Bizkit and Korn. But then there's also that cheesy synth line and some funky organ in the verses that keep the instrumentation from being fully predictable. The song is even more amusing if your first time hearing Rock in the Suburbs was during the end credits of the banger 2004 film Over the Hedge, with rewritten lyrics that still feature quite a lot of biting satire for something in a kid's movie. Though in this case he wasn't quite as pissed off to the point where it made him want to say 2002, number 26. Salmon Hater, 6.66, one hundredth of the number of the beast. When Triple J's breakfast radio hosts at the time, Will Anderson and Adam Spencer, got into a discussion about heavy metal, Spencer jokingly claimed that his favourite metal band was a local fish metal band called Salmon Hater. Then they started putting together an elaborate backstory for this supposed band, with math nerd Spencer claiming that Salmon Hater's first single was called 6.66, one hundredth of the number of the beast. Just a matter of days after Spencer had originally created that spoof band, he and Anderson received a copy, supposedly, of Salmon Hater's debut single. 6.66 is one hundred of the number of the beast. They naturally played the song on air a couple of times before encouraging listeners to vote for the song in that year's Hottest 100, apparently only days before the polls for that countdown were going to close. So despite that, it impressively managed to poll just outside the top quarter of the chart. Some people felt that this sort of behaviour may have undermined the integrity of the Hottest 100, but I think most people agree that the Salmon Hater situation isn't the same as that Taylor Swift situation. It was only after the countdown was done in early 2003 that Anderson and Spencer, with the help of Triple J listeners put together a music video for 6.66, which allowed the song to be played on Rage when they played every song that charted in the Hottest 100 of 2002 a month or two later. Honourable mention goes to a real Aussie band called The Drugs at number 38, with a song about long-running US soap The Bold and the Beautiful that alternates between sappy I'll be a CJ if you be my Becky and Rappy. Brooke wasn't happy with the simple separation. She says, I'll get that guy. 2003, number 28, Electric Six, Danger, High Voltage. You're probably a little bit more familiar with this song compared to the earlier ones I mentioned, but that doesn't make it any less weird. Detroit's Electric Six are like America's more musically refined and probably not quite as profane answer to Tism. Their other big hit, Gay Bar, wasn't all that far behind Deja High Voltage in the countdown that year, but Gay Bar feels too outwardly catchy for me to pick it as the weirdest song here. Whereas when I listen to Danger High Voltage, I genuinely think, what the fuck? What is this accent that Dick Valentine was trying to put on here? But the most outrageous element of Danger High Voltage is possibly Valentine's duet partner, Jack Motherfucking White, putting his whole pussy into that vocal performance. Meanwhile, the slick funky instrumental isn't all that unusual on its own. Though towards the end, you do get a bit of an experimental saxophone solo. And yet, despite Electric Six's prolific output, including 20 studio albums in 20 years, 2003 was the only edition of the Hottest 100 that they've appeared in so far. 2004, number 60, Your Wedding Night, L-A-C-H-L-A-N. If you've ever been really, really horny for a guy named Lachlan, oh fuck yeah, then here's the song for you. Maybe less so of Lachlan's your name, or the name of one of your relatives. But underneath all the talk about Lachlan being an absolute sex machine is a raw post-punk instrumental with an especially mean-sounding bass. So as odd as the subject matter is, I do dig the fuck out of this song. It's an approach that makes me think of Wet Legs 2021 breakthrough single Shays Long, except that it's about fucking a guy named Lachlan. 
The self-titled EP featuring L-A-C-H-L-A-N is the only Your Wedding Night release to date. Though band member Kelly Sutherland is better known as a member of the indie pop band Architecture in Helsinki, a mainstay on Triple J throughout the 2000s and early 2010s. Honourable mention goes to number 21, William Shatner covering Common People by Pulp. Ugh. 2005, number 72, The Bedroom Philosopher, I'm So Postmodern. Like Ginsberg's Ballad of the Skeletons, I'm So Postmodern features a simple repeating lyric formula. He's so postmodern that he does this. He's so postmodern that he does that. But it's in the name of absurdist comedy rather than pretentious bullshit. I'm so postmodern, I've obviously done so well off the profits of this song. I can't remember which of the lyrics go in. I'm off my head on ice. <laughs> as the bedroom philosopher and as a postmodernist, Justin Hazelwood claims that he does things like sending a letter to his council. This song's so fucking stupid, but hey, I think it's funny as shit. Also, the video for the song is a similarly absurd lyric video. The brand of surreal humour here makes this song and its music video feel like it could have come out in this decade, but it came out in 2005. Postmodern indeed. 2006. Number 44. Lady Sovereign. Love Me or Hate Me. Remember when a five-foot chav lady was one of the biggest rising stars in hip-hop? Well, if you did hear this song back in the day, then it's probably hard to forget iconic lines like It's officially the biggest midget in the game I ain't got the biggest breastlessness, but I write all the bestnesses Let them be as moves, my burp in your face Say, who produced this song? Oh, no, 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 no Lady Sovereign certainly did endear herself to Australians as well by speeding on one of our nightclub bouncers, seven hours after first arriving in the country. That incident happened in 2009, which is also the last year that Lady Sovereign put out any new music. I'd make a joke about how it's no real great loss, but apparently a lot of it is down to the fact that she has a rare condition called cyclic vomiting syndrome. Yeah, I mostly just feel bad for her now. 2007, number 27, Operator Please, just a song about ping pong. The members of Operator Please were all between the ages of 17 and 19 when they first wrote and recorded this song, and it definitely sounds that way. Back then, I don't think I could truly understand any of the lyrics in this song except it's just a song about ping pong. After that, it just kind of sounded like I mean, is this song even about ping pong? Well, now that I've looked up the actual lyrics for the song, I can confidently say... Maybe? Maybe quirky is a better word for the song than weird, but I was really struggling to find a song that I would consider genuinely weird when I was looking through the 2007 songs. I guess I could give an honourable mention though to number 21, which was The Salmon Dance by The Chemical Brothers. Learning how to do a dance and learning about salmon? What a truly enlightening song. 2008, number 45, Muscles, Ice Cream, Triple J Live Acoustic Version. The best known song by Melbourne producer Muscles, his 2007 single Ice Cream is a very 2000 sounding electronic song. With buzzing bass, bright syncopated lead synths, and angsty vocals that are singing about nothing in particular. This version of Ice Cream that appeared in the 2008 countdown is just Muscles voice and a piano, transforming the song from an awkward electro clash thumper to the sort of pop song cover that you've heard 500 times on a show like The X Factor. There's an element of hilarity to this performance as Muscle's voice sounds like Gavin Rossdale after spending the prior week dealing with laryngitis. He could have a knife, stab me with a gun. There definitely may have been at least a hint of irony in this performance. But I especially get that impression when in the middle of this emotional piano cover, he starts doing the woo ah bit from the original song. Woo ah so yeah, I find this cover quite amusing for reasons that may or may not have been intentional. Honourable mention goes to number 55, Your Party by Ween. Because often the weirdest Ween songs are the ones that don't sound all that weird at all. But that's also why I didn't ultimately make it my main pick for this countdown. Because it's just some soft rock crap. How did so many people vote for this? 2009, number 2, Art vs Science, Parlez-vous Francais.
The late 2000s and early 2010s was essentially the peak period for Aussie bands that were making bombastic electronica with heavy rock influences, like Pendulum, The Presets, and Art vs. Science. But unlike the moodier Presets and Pendulum, Art vs. Science were generally just bouncing off the fucking walls. Parlez-vous Francais came out perhaps towards the tail end of the whole modern dance punk craze, exemplifying the genre with its part live, part programmed busy drums, somewhat shouty vocals, and fat ass bass. The song's topped off by Jim and the two Dans attempting to tell someone to take off their shirt in broken French that is probably more literally translated as go fall the shirt. I think back in the day whenever I heard Art vs. Science's singles I was just kind of like, huh? But I reckon I could see myself listen to them more often nowadays. 2010, number 11, Pendulum. ABC News theme remix. I mean, the title pretty much gives you all the context that you need. But what's also weird to me is that this remix is a bit uneventful. I mean, Pendulum, of course, a band that are known for making a lot of songs together. So it's a bit strange to me that their remix here is basically just taking that original recording of the old ABC News theme, then putting a four on the floor beat and a droning bass line underneath it. And by the sounds of it, not a whole lot else. Even with the nostalgia factor for people who grew up hearing this news theme constantly, not myself included. It's still wild to me that for how successful Pendulum have been, this is the song that's been voted the highest in a Hottest 100. 2011, number 71, Luke Million, Arnold. This guy took an Arnold Schwarzenegger aerobics instruction tape, put some funky bass and very 80s sounding synths and drum machines underneath it, and then he just vanished. At least as far as most Triple J listers are aware. An honourable mention at number 99 goes to The Beards, a band of, unsurprisingly, bearded men who exclusively wrote songs about how good beards are. This was their only Hottest 100 charting song, and it was called... It's a having sex with a bearded man. 2012, number 55, Knife Party, Internet Friends. You know, the one with the drop that says, You blocked me on Facebook, and now you're going to die. If you first heard this song when you were growing up, then you probably found that line hilarious, at least briefly. And in case you didn't know, Knife Party are the two main members of Pendulum. So congratulations, fellas, you managed to put out the weirdest song in two separate countdowns. I mean, I didn't feel like there were any other especially weird songs in either of those countdowns, so it's maybe by technicality, but well done anyways. 2013, number 51, Fatboy Slim and Reva star featuring Beardy Man. Eat, sleep, rave, repeat. It feels like in the last decade there's been an increase in popular club songs which just have the most bare minimum electronic pulse and then just putting literally any fucking kind of vocal sample over the top. This song would be basically nothing without the hilarious dialogue from English comedian and beatboxer Beardy Man. Or maybe they were cops. I think they might have been cops. But anyway, like, I was just dancing and dancing and... Oh no, they were cops. Yes, he is English. <laughs> I'm not crazy! And incredibly, he improved all of that dialogue and recorded it in a single take. So yeah, it should be Beardy Man featuring Fatboy Slim and whoever the fuck the other guy is. 2014, number 14, Alt-J, Every Other Freckle. Alt-J put out a pretty damn popular debut album in 2012, where one of the songs went like, <laughs> Sadly, Fitz Pleasure was not one of the three Alt-J songs that polled in the Hottest 100 that year. If it had, I would have picked it over Internet Friends in a heartbeat. At least I could pick the weirdest single from their second album, in this case. Every other Freckles instrumentation is a peculiar blend of soft indie guitars with deep buzzing synthesizers. The vocals are melodically pretty top draw, though the little bridge bit where it goes like do 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 like it just feels like such a mental whiplash moment, completely removed from the rest of the song. But of course, what really drives home the weirdness of every other freckle are the lyrics. Firstly, this isn't a chorus, this is a voice. You get me? Then of course in the verses you've got all those metaphors for what Alt-J are going to do to their lover, which had probably never been sung in any other songs before, and probably never will again. Like the most infamous lyric where Joe Newman tells us that he's going to... Turn you inside out and lick you like a crisp packet. 
It's a bit of a weird analogy. And yet, this still manages to not feel as icky as Deep by E17. I still maybe haven't gotten over how fucking awful that song is. 2015, number 88, The Bennies, Party Machine. This song is a solution if you've ever listened to Andrew WK and thought, I like this, but I kind of wish it was more bogany. Whilst Andrew WK has generally stuck to more of a hard rock kind of formula, Party Machine by the Bennies has a general punk rock framework, but then it goes into a ska verse, and also stops for some full-blown synthesizer solos along the way. It's definitely not the weirdest song in my list here, but it's a blend of genres that I don't think was tackled by anyone else in that year's countdown. 2016, number 79, Radiohead, Burn the Witch. You probably don't remember this band. They were just a bunch of British weirdos. Creeps, even. However, I do stand by the song choice because there isn't really any other song like it in this particular countdown. The only other song that I could find in this Hottest 100 that's also fairly orchestral is Strange Diseases by Gang of Youths. However, Gang of Youths' string parts are generally more traditional and possibly 60s pop influenced. Meanwhile, at the start of Burn the Witch, the orchestra sounds like they're trying to claw their way through your window. And then the orchestra is blended with a drum machine and a synth pulse that both sound like they would have been played on high-end equipment, but have an almost lo-fi buzzing quality to them. It's not a combination of instruments that you hear very often in general. So without listening back to every song in the 2016 Hottest 100, I'm fairly confident that this is the only song that has that combo of instruments on it. Honourable mention at number 52 goes to Halsey when she went into Triple J Studios, covered Love Yourself by Justin Bieber, except she replaced the word love with... You should go and fuck yourself, fuck yourself, fuck yourself, fuck yourself. On second thought, can we bring back the William Shatner spoken word covers, please? 2017, number 73, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, Nuclear Fusion. Again, not exactly going too far underground with this pick, but whilst King Gears have gotten plenty of support from Triple J over the years, this is one of only two appearances that they've ever made in a Hottest 100 countdown. Also, there weren't too many artists getting played on Triple J back then that were making deliberate use of microtones, even if the way that King Gears that incorporate microtones into their music doesn't sound all that uncanny. Unlike the bit where they play the title drop at half speed. You and I might be quite used to the gears, but I guess by average Triple J listener standards, they're maybe a little bit off-putting. Otherwise, they surely appear in these polls more often. Honorable mention at number 51 goes to... Yep, they went there. 2018, number 63, Brockhampton, Boogie. Despite having a clear sort of pop rap approach, this song is so oddly put together to me. You've got that repeating saxophone loop that I'm pretty sure isn't even in the right key. Then they pitch it up an octave and it sounds even weirder. Then you've got a loop of someone going, woo, woo, for almost the entire song. Both those things made this song very bewildering to hear on the radio. It might have been part of why I was a bit confused why this group had such insane amounts of hype back in the day. There's also the sudden introduction of some Mellotron-like synth strings in the middle of the song, which is something I'd completely forgotten about, possibly because I just mentally clocked out whenever I heard the first part of the song. But Boogie's so brash that I feel like I might be circling back to actually liking the song. I'd certainly say I respect it, at least. Adding a bit to the weirdness is the well-known fact that Brockhampton had about 14 members, with some of the people counted as official members including their manager, a graphic designer, a webmaster, I think Kevin Abstract's dentist is in there somewhere, my cat was also somehow credited as a member. 2019, number 12, Fiddler, By Myself. Looking at the full list for 2019, I didn't really find anything that struck me as particularly out there. I've gone for this song mainly because it's a bit of a switch up compared to what Fiddler had been known for doing beforehand. The other Fiddler songs that I'd heard were generally of like a garage punk style, very bratty garage punk at that. Then suddenly this song brings in some electronic drums that makes them sound more like Kasabian, I guess? There's also the way that this song feels like it doesn't portray excessive drinking in a very positive light. But then there's a part where he says, God, like, being sober just sucks, man. 
I think contrasting those two themes has been a pretty common thread throughout Fiddler's discography though. Also, I've heard Triple J play a bunch of different Fiddler songs over the years, yet somehow this is the only one of theirs that's appeared in a Hottest 100 so far. This one, out of all of them. Uh, yeah, I don't know. 2020. Number 54. Eiffel 65? Blue? Oh, Flume Remix. In the last decade or so, Flume has pretty much been able to get away with anything, including uh, Analingus on stage at Burning Man. I understand that this remix was probably created as a little bit of a shit post, but it's not really an interesting shit post in that. I mean, this remix basically boils down to step one, put a little bit more reverb on the piano part. Step 2, play the melodic break of the middle on a more choppy sounding synth. Step 3, play the bass line on some really fat sub bass, and voila. Ah. Oh hang on, this could be leading to something absolutely nuts. <laughs> nope, it's just the same stuff that was happening earlier. As my Hottest 100 number 1's video may have suggested, 2020 was just a pretty shit edition of the Hottest 100 all around. A shit year in general, really. 2021, number 11. Tom Cardi, H-Y-C-Y-B-H. Before putting this video together, I hadn't heard many of Tom Cardi's songs, but I knew that he was a comedy musician and like a one-man band type of deal, so I figured that he may have been an option for this video. As I was listening to this song for the first time, let me tell you, when it finally revealed what H-Y-C-Y-B-H stands for, I was floored. Do you know where my car keys are? Have you checked your bottle? If you want to know how the rest of the song can possibly build upon that premise, then go and hear the song for yourself, because, you know, I don't want to be the guy that explains the jokes. Yes, it is a bit immature, but hey, I got a kick out of it, and it certainly deserves its place in this video about weird songs. And now, here's probably, objectively, the least weird song that I'm featuring in this video. Number 28, Lewd and Matafix, Big City Life. I picked this for most of the same reasons that I picked Flume's remix of Blue. In this case, it's fellow Aussie producer Lude reworking the 2005 hit Big City Life by British duo Matafix. And it basically amounts to taking the vocals from the original song, putting the typical drum and bass beat underneath it, and playing the song's original chord progression on a deep wub wub synth. This rework charted modestly on the National Aussie chart, but in the UK, it actually outperformed the original Matafix song. What's more, in 2021, Lude did pretty much the exact same thing, but with Down Under by Men at Work instead. That song appeared at number 65 in that year's Hottest 100. Now let's see what other music Lude has been making. Oh my god. This is his entire gimmick, isn't it? Here he is doing the same thing to Bittersweet Symphony. And the same thing to the 2005 hit Turn Me On by Caribbean singer Kevin Little. And the same thing to the nosebleed section by local hip hop legends Hilltop Hoods. Okay, this might be an original song featuring Moby? Alright, let's give this a listen. Oh, it's porcelain, for fuck's sake. Am I the only person who finds this kind of insane? Is this all it takes to become a popular producer nowadays? Is it even worth it when you'd be splitting at least half of your royalties with the artists that you're reworking the songs of? Maybe Lude's doing this to try and get people to gradually check out his original songs. But Lude's been putting out singles since 2015, both solo and as a part of the duo Tumba with his cousin. And none of his songs have been popping off anywhere near as much as his remixes. 2023, number 25, Drake. Rich Baby Daddy featuring Sexy Red and Scissor. Being a Drake song, this obviously isn't all that avant-garde in a musical sense. I'm putting it here because there's quite a bit of a contrast between the hook and the different verses. In Drake's first verse, he's doing his usual sad boy routine, like, Hey girl, I know you're seeing someone, but I'd really like to get together with you. I mean, I'm, I'm rich after all, why wouldn't you want to be with me? And then Sexy Red basically just barges in like, twerk! 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 Scissor has the next verse, and she's a little bit more direct about her feelings, but other than that, it's a fairly typical emotional I said twerk! Song. Hi, I'm Sexy Red, and I am... Sexy. Didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as long as she isn't rapping about doing non-consensual things, then Sexy Red can rap about whatever she likes, as far as I'm concerned. 
I'm just saying that I see where a lot of people are coming from where they feel that the sexy red parts don't really fit the rest of this song. But of course, this is a Drake song, and Drake can do whatever the fuck he wants at this point. And now, here's my pick for the weirdest song out of all of Triple J's special editions of the Hottest 100. Those special countdowns tend to be made up of almost entirely well-known and generally agreeable songs. However, the first three editions of the poll include a number of songs released in 1989, 1990 or 1991 that likely only appeared in those all-time countdowns mainly thanks to recency bias. Though I'm certainly open to hearing arguments that songs like Wise Up Sucker by Pop Will Eat Itself Info Freako by Jesus Jones and The Size of a Cow by The Wonder Stuff are all timeless classics. Anyways, when it comes to my quest for weirdness, none of those three songs can compete with a song that has a hook like this. <laughs> this is The Cicada That Ate Five Doc by Sydney band Outline. The song appeared in just one edition of the Hottest 100, the first ever all-time Hot 100 in 1989 at number 99. Because of that, you might think that this song was a cult hit released that very year, but it actually came out eight years earlier. What's more, Outline had only formed two years before putting out this song and broke up the year after releasing it. It doesn't look like Outline have had any real sort of vindication since 1989 either, because they don't even have a Wikipedia page. Musically, this is a punky new wave song, which I think took quite a bit of influence from UK punk pioneers The Damned, in both the band's lavish costumes in the video, and also the fact that the singer sounds like Dave Vanian, straight up. I guess this song had a very localised sort of appeal. And as someone who didn't grow up in Sydney in the early 1980s, I don't know what the fuck it was doing in the first ever Hottest 100 countdown, and that countdown alone. Alright, so those were my picks for the weirdest song in every annual Hottest 100, plus the weirdest song out of all of the multi-year polls that have been done. Here's how I'd sort each of those songs into my five categories of weirdness from the start of the video. Let me know in the comments if you think that there was a weirder song for a particular year that I could have chosen. And if you're not sure whether that song actually polled in the Hottest 100 that year, then check out the Hottest 100 archive on Triple J's website where you can sort by each year or search an artist or song across every countdown that's happened. But that's all from me for now. Bye-bye.